Welcome to this quick introduction to a Tenderfoot session focused on beginning to help pupils take that important step from block-based programming to text-based programming in Key Stage 3. As teachers ourselves, we understand that this transition can be a difficult step for children to take. Therefore, this session and others will look at some tried and tested approaches to help making this transition as smooth and rewarding as it can be and should be for pupils in Key Stage 3. And, most importantly for us, how it can all be of use for you as teachers of computer science. You see, the main aim of each of these sessions is to provide teachers like yourself with meaningful and practical professional development, driven by proved approaches to teaching computer science, along with relevant, hands-on investigations and problem-solving activities. We want to leave it up to you as teachers to judge what might be appropriate for your own pupils and at what age you think the activities might work best for them. We simply aim to give teachers the confidence and knowledge by passing on ideas and approaches that we have found to work well in other classrooms that can be adapted and used to enrich your own Key Stage 3 lessons or that of your department or learning community as a whole. However, as this video is designed just to give a brief outline of the content, support and resources available within the session, I recommend that after watching it, that you visit the Tenderfoot programme online and see how you too can undertake the session in its entirety and at your own pace as a starting point with which you can get the most from the session as a whole. The link to this is in the description below the video and will appear throughout as well as at the end. As will links to CAS Online, where you can join our grassroots community and subscribe to this channel to get updated information on the videos and other material we release. But for now, let me introduce how we can help pupils when transitioning to text. In this final session of our Lane Firm Foundations Unit, the focus is very much on the need for pupils to transition to text-based programming and some of the ways in which this might be approached, along with helping to manage the cognitive load involved when pupils step up to writing text-based programs. As the session unpicks and practice shows, it is generally through a gradual and staged approach that pupils can best make progress, and that the reading, interpretation, prediction and analysis of written code plays just as an important role in this process as beginning to write code itself. The session also continues, like previous ones, to highlight and draw out the three core programming constructs and four key computational thinking concepts that we want pupils to embed and become skilled at if we are to succeed in helping them to think like computer scientists. But here, in a framework based around that transition to text and those tools and approaches that can help this process. After working through the session as a whole, you will no doubt go away with some clear outcomes each reached through an exploration of a number of practical classroom activities best suited for Key Stage 3 or above. In this session, these particular outcomes are to 1. Apply the key concepts required to write programs 2. Recognise the three key constructs in every program 3. Become familiar with flowcharts articulating these constructs and 4. Have considered some challenges posed by text-based coding. In fact, the session begins by considering a very common challenge posed by text-based coding, one often referred to as a syntax barrier, and how we might enable pupils to get over what might be the biggest barrier for many, the necessity to type commands accurately. It is a fact that as text programming environments can be unforgiving in respects to syntax, that an emphasis right from the start on accuracy and attention to detail is an essential part of this transition process for pupils. I'm sure that we've all been frustrated at one time or another by syntax errors and the need for commands to be 100% accurate for code to execute correctly or execute at all. And this can be magnified for pupils new to text-based programming and act as a real barrier to those that might struggle with accuracy. And as a result, this can have a huge effect on both their progression and motivation to learn. However, as a session unpicks, there are a number of approaches and environments that can offer us as teachers different structures and facilities to help pupils in this respect. Yet, whatever approach we use as teachers, the emphasis on accuracy and attention to detail is essential and must be built into the learning process in some way, as there is no escaping that it is a required skill in text-based programming and something that we all need to develop in order to succeed in this area. But that doesn't mean we need to drop pupils in at the deep end immediately, and the session looks at just how this might be done in more of a staged manner. With this in mind, the practical activities covered in the session begins by looking at just how we can employ HTML and other markup languages as a good place to begin building in pupils the importance of syntactic accuracy in ways that are manageable yet still challenging for them. 
Here, the session looks at how HTML is a good starting point, partly because it would have already been experienced by many pupils prior to Key Stage 3, and not be completely alien to them. While at the same time, because it is the markup language, pupils get an immediate feedback on the accuracy of their code. It is either displayed as expected or it doesn't. And, as such, it tends not to be as frustrating for new text-based coders when making errors and aiming for accuracy. Finally, and most important in many ways, it allows teachers and students to focus on accuracy without the extra cognitive load needed to also think through the logic and outcomes of various algorithms as they write. Given the need to motivate and engage pupils to want to write code, along with the ease of creation of using the plain text editor and not having to deal with the multiple layers of cognitive challenge, working with HTML can provide an ideal introduction to the necessary rigour of text-based coding. And to support this approach further, we look forward to including a range of HTML exercises in some of our later sessions, each of which will help build pupils' confidence and which you can expand on and explore when you take part in or work through these sessions. Following these initial ideas and strategies, the session then goes on to explore other real and motivational contexts with which to help counter the extra cognitive load of text-based coding that might otherwise act as a barrier for pupils. Here, the session examines how real robotics can provide a great example of just such a strong motivational context, and one which can also allow them to make real links between what they are doing in the classroom and the real world around them. It begins by looking at a range of videos of robots in the real world, and how these can be used as a strong stimulus to provide a great introduction to the topic. Just as there are many examples of different robots in the real world, the session also makes clear that there are many different devices and platforms that schools might use in teaching coding through robotics. But rather than being stuck on the particular platform used, it is the motivational drive that robotics provide for pupils that the session shows is important in engaging and motivating them while they tackle the cognitive load of text-based programming. And we feel it's important to leave up to teachers and schools as to which platform is best suited for them. The session also considers that before attempting more complex hardware-based robotics, the exercises using simple robotic simulators can help provide a great initial grounding for pupils and further help them manage the cognitive load they undertake in this transition. In this instance, we look at RoboMind, an environment developed at Amsterdam University and purpose-built for education, and using the free version, which is available along with the other session resources. Being a simple robot simulation, RoboMind provides an excellent way to transition to text-based programming, while also paving the way towards pupils' further exploration of robotics using industry standard languages and hardware. With the gradual scaffolded approach in mind, the session first looks at the remote control option available in RoboMind, and how this can be used to help children manage the transition and overcome potential barriers. Here, just like any other remote controlled object, pupils can quickly experiment in order to see how Robo moves and is controlled. Yet, as the session explores, this doesn't mean that there are not plenty of challenges we can ask of pupils just using this approach. For example, we can challenge them to use a remote control to pick up and store a number of objects in the most efficient way possible, amongst many other challenges. At the same time, this particular remote control also generates code for each movement and offers a great way for pupils to see just how their clicks are translated into text-based commands which in itself can offer us lots of opportunities to set challenges and activities based around analysing and predicting code. But as well as generating commands from their movement of the remote control, pupils are also able to then copy and paste the commands generated into an on-screen editor, which they can then tidy up and run as a separate programme based on any number of learning objectives. For example, they can use it to make their code more efficient and begin modifying and writing text-based code in this more scaffolded environment where they are considering things such as efficiency rather than just accuracy. They can then also save this as a file and work on it at a later date, allowing us as teachers to explore and expand on things in more depth over a number of lessons. Along with this, the session also goes on to show how the RoboMind environment lets us insert commands rather than having to write them afresh, therefore minimising syntax errors for pupils, allowing that barrier to be lowered and so, like Scratch, the focus can be on arranging code and understanding the flow and making things happen, adding further to its motivational qualities, and allowing us to focus them more readily on the reading, interpretation and analysis of these text commands, which is an important initial approach towards the understanding of syntax at a time when it is still new to pupils. Using the RoboMind environment, the session investigates four activities, 
each one growing in gradual complexity as the pupils become more experienced and each one building on the lessons, skills and aptitudes of the previous activity. While always being mindful of not adding to the pupils' cognitive load, but rather helping them to manage this load to make real progression. In fact, the first of these four activities is an unplugged exercise called Passing the Beacons, which focuses on decomposition that uses a printed out map and a small wooden block to simulate robo. This way, the pupils get to work in a tactile way in order to work out their algorithms. Handling robo to move the objects out of the way and jotting the commands down for this as they work alone or in pairs. As I mentioned, this is an exercise in decomposition, but also in generalization because as they walk through the actions, they should become aware of a repeating sequence, this being a loop, which they notice as they move things by hand away from the screen. By undertaking this in a tactile, unplugged manner, it can make this more obvious to many pupils. The session also continues to reflect on and examine those barriers that pupils might come across while they make this transition to text, and how these might be overcome through a range of approaches to teaching and learning. However, the session is careful not to move on too quickly, and examines the need for children to really embed the basics first. Making clear that, even if children create code that works, asking them to explain it will reveal the true thought processes involved and is an important way to measure their understanding. As is reading code snippets, saying them aloud and predicting how it might work. This is a good precursor to writing code and something the session looks at developing through the RoboMind activities. As these progress, they introduce other things, such as two different types of loop, conditional and counter-controlled loops, and how these can be understood and then used within RoboMind. Again, this is all done in a staged manner and in ways that introduce one thing at a time and in ways which avoid cognitive overload. At the same time, making references back to the same constructs as they would have experienced in block-based languages, such as Scratch or Build Your Own Blocks. As the session and activities continue, we look at other tools which we can provide to help pupils overcome the potential barriers in this transition. For example, in one of the investigations, where we consider how to get Robo to walk, we introduce flowcharts as a way to help visualise program flow and how various constructs function. But we're always mindful that reading comes before writing. As such, the session illustrates how real learning starts to happen when pupils observe the written code and can predict and observe it alongside the code being run. At this point, pupils can achieve experienced reasoning around what they observe, and from this build their own mental model of what to expect, which is essential for secure understanding. As I said at the very beginning of this introduction, there is so much more to the session than I am able to introduce here and the activities within RoboMind really need to be looked at in detail to appreciate just how much they can provide support and challenge for pupils and offer us as teachers of computer science, even if we are new to the subject, a teaching toolkit of our own with which we are able to enable pupils to progress. But for now, I hope this short video introduction has given you some sense of the ways the session supports this transition to text-based programming and some of the ways that this might be done. And I'm certain that when working through the sessions as a whole, you'll go away with a clear set of outcomes that you can then use in your own practice. In this case, these being to, one, apply the key concepts required to write programs, two, recognize the three key constructs in every program, three, become familiar with flowcharts that articulate the constructs, and four, to have had the opportunity to consider some challenges posed by text-based coding whilst also equipping you with the materials and ideas to meet these outcomes and provide you with greater knowledge and certain tools to apply them to create meaningful outcomes for Key Stage 3 learners.